Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I interview a lifelong Oregonian who is on a quest to not only be a successful business owner, but to be a successful corporate citizen as well. And that is what we'll highlight today. What is a corporate citizen? Why is it important to business? And how can I become one? First, what is it? What is this corporate citizen jazz? What does it mean? And why is it important? Why do I care? The gist of being a good corporate citizen means, and I quote, being guided by strong moral and ethical standards in daily interactions with customers, shareholders, and employees, end quote. In short, a corporate citizen looks at ways to improve in our economy locally, regionally, globally, or all of the above. This is not corporate philanthropy, simply tossing money to a problem in hopes that that fixes it. No, this is rolling up the sleeves and aiming to solve social issues by working towards that goal. Let's take Tom's shoes, for example, an example used often because it is so simple yet makes perfect sense. For every pair of Tom's shoes purchased, a pair of new shoes is given to a child in need in partnership with humanitarian organizations. Talk about addressing a social issue as a corporation. Wow. I was recently reading the Harvard Business Journal when I came across an article titled Becoming a Better Corporate Citizen, How Pepsi Incorporated Moved Towards a Healthier Future. In the article, it discusses Pepsi's journey to becoming a better corporate citizen. And no, this does not mean hiring Kendall Jenner to hand out Pepsis during a riot. Pepsi created a strategic plan that incorporated being a corporate citizen into a new approach called the Performance of Purpose, or PWP, which was based, as many strategic plans are, off a pillar system. Pepsi aimed to address four pillars in the strategic plan. This next section is from the article in the Harvard Business Journal. Delivering superior financial returns, financial sustainability, transforming the product portfolio by reducing the sugar, salt, and fat in our products while dialing up more healthier, more nutritional foods and beverages, human sustainability, Limiting our environmental impact by conserving water and reducing our carbon footprint in plastic waste. Environmental sustainability. And lifting people by offering new types of support to women and families inside the company and in the communities we serve. Talent sustainability. These are all derivatives of being a better corporate citizen. But why? Did it help Pepsi? Well, according to the HBR article, Pepsi company portfolio grew 38% of revenue in 2006 to 50% in 2017, 25% water reduction from 2006 to 2018, 22 million citizens received safe drinking water, 39% of senior management roles are held by women as of 2018, and 80% net revenue growth since PWP was implemented. Stocks also outperformed the S&P 500 in a 5-year total shared return, or TSR, and the 10-year TSR. Now, if you're an entrepreneur or a small business or a corporation, becoming a corporate citizen starts with the top, either the founder, senior management, or the board of directors. Having allies that align with the social mission is important too. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. Do not forget that. A cave employee that is constantly against virtually everything can derail even the best of intentions. When employees, management, and the board members leave, Ensure that new recruits and hires align with the social mission of the company, board, or owner. And if the entrepreneur pursues a corporate citizenship mission, it is important that the company communicates its purpose-driven strategy in layman's terms. Take Panagonia, for example. Panagonia has, at times, left hidden messages on their tags encouraging the consumers to act, whether that is to address climate change, remember Earth Day, or simply to vote that asshole out. Panagonia ensures that their social missions are stated loud and clear. But how? How does an entrepreneur become a good corporate citizen? Well, as I stated above, it starts at the top. A good corporate citizen means being guided by strong and moral and ethical standards in the daily interactions with customers, shareholders, and employees. It is a balancing act of caring for shareholders and community needs. And shareholders can be quite expansive. Employees, vendors, board members families who loaned you money. The goal is to do right by those who have supported us. And this list is all-inclusive. It takes a village, people. 
As corporate social responsibilities, also known as CSR, become more used and implemented in the business world, entrepreneurs can expect to be asked, what is the said business social responsibility? If you're starting a business today, what corporate social responsibilities would you support? Any? None? This is the question I do not know, but I do know this. Consumers are asking, and they are taking notes. This podcast was edited by Modern Ally, the business for small businesses and nonprofits who want their graphic design, marketing, social media, video, and other media projects done right. Modern Ally has a passion for supporting community education and social rights. The best part, Modern Ally meets businesses where they're at and works to create custom packages and services that fit your business needs at your budget. Say goodbye to overpriced, unpersonal, and out-of-touch agencies and say hello to your newest ally. To get started, visit yourmodernally.com or you can follow Modern Ally on Facebook or Instagram. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. My next guest spent 20 years as a teacher, 21 years as a father, 25 years as a husband, and 47 years trying to live the most interesting life possible. Please welcome the owner of the Pharmacy Bar in Northwest Portland, Brian Gardas. Today, I have the founder and owner of the Pharmacy. This is a bar, which I'm very excited about because if you don't know, I like to have some drinks. Brian Gardas, how are you doing, my good man? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. I got to tell you, when you said you had air conditioning, I was in. (laughs) We we could talk about anything, but having air conditioning got me here. This heat has been brutal. My goodness. So... Tell us about you. Let's hear who is Brian. Wow. There's a very good Buddhist question for you. Who is Brian? (laughs) I am a lifelong Portlander. My family moved here in the early 1970s, Uh, went to Lincoln High School, took a few years off, went to Iowa to go to college, Uh, met a lovely girl there, got married, moved back to Oregon and have been here ever since. I was a teacher with Portland Public Schools for 21 years, uh, retired from it, and bought a bar. So, Because, I mean, that's what you do, right? Of course. Yeah. In my previous spare time, I have no spare time right now because I own a bar, (laughs) but in my previous spare time, uh, I played rugby, was a world traveler, and a deep interest in comic books. Nice. what's, What's your favorite comic? Uh, as a kid growing up, it was probably Luke Cage, Power Man. Nice. So, yeah. It's, I, I was an X-Men junkie myself. Gambit, there you go. Gambit was my guy. Yeah, I, I definitely dug deep on Gambit as well. Anybody can throw poker cards and hit somebody with them. That's pretty impressive. Well, in the trench coat over the uh, pink leotard. I mean, come on. It's hard to pull that that's off. That. <laughs> so let's let's tell the folks at home, what is the pharmacy? It's a bar. Right. But so, what is it? So the pharmacy is a bar uh, located in Northwest Portland in a historic pharmacy building. We probably get one or two people a week walking in thinking that's still a pharmacy. We offer cures to ail them, of course. But um, <laughs> no, there um, it's the old Knob Hill Pharmacy building. There was a pharmacy there uh, from 1892 until 2005. Uh, it's where Gus Van Sant filmed the opening scene in his movie, Drugstore Cowboy. Wow. We aim to be a good neighborhood bar, a place for uh, regulars to come in and hang out and have a good drink, good good food. Nice. Nice time. We do live music, DJ sets, community activities. So it's just a good, fun place to be. I love it. And why, did, why a bar? Why did you decide to go with the bar? Well, the long story, as it was, is that um, I had a a person who I carpooled with every day to work for two, three years. And you're sitting in the car and after you go through the, you know, how was your day? How was your day thing? You start to spitball and talk about, well, if you weren't teaching, what would you do? And I love throwing parties. I, I, I'm a social person. I love throwing parties. And so we got to talking about how cool it would be to have a space where basically every night you get to throw a party. And that's a bar. 
And so you talk about, well, what kind of bar would you own? Because there's so many different bars out there. There's dive bars, there's craft cocktail bars, and there's event spaces. And the thing I really wanted to have was a neighborhood bar. I wanted a place where I could go and hang out and feel comfortable and be with my friends. And, you know, that's kind of the trap for owning a bar is that people get wrapped up in that and how you get to drink for free and things like that. And I was very clear as I went into it that that wasn't the part that I wanted. I I enjoy hosting parties and I enjoy hosting a good time. And so I wanted to make sure that I would I would have a bar like that. And so when I hit the 20 year mark of teaching, I was feeling really burned out. I was becoming the teacher. I didn't want to be the guy who was mad at you Mm. before you even had a chance to screw up. We all had that teacher at school. Yeah. And um, it wasn't fair to the students at all. And I hated being that guy. And so I just decided that I was going to take a year and figure out how to get my fire and passion back for teaching. And as one thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another, you end up uh, one day owning a bar. (laughs) Yeah. And you know, one of the things I found fascinating that you mentioned is going through the process and determining what kind of bar you wanted. Mm -hmm. Because I'm I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, you know, I never... Thought about that. There are dive bars or what are they called? The speakeasies. Those, those yeah. things, yes. And then the cocktail bars. Mm-hmm. Why the neighborhood bar? So one of the things that really appeals to me about a neighborhood bar is sort of that cheers approach of everybody knows your name. Oh, yeah. And it sounds crazy, but that's one of the difficult things to find in Portland. Um, you know, there was the dive bar craze of the last, I don't know, 10 years or so, but unfortunately the rent's just too damn high and you can't get by on $2 PBRs and, you know, tater tots anymore. And so trying to find a bar space where I would feel comfortable going, that would still be reasonable for regulars to go to, but then could host events every so often that again would bring in the community was, was really what I wanted. It felt like it was sort of the best of both worlds. And so I started sitting down thinking about, okay, if I want to go to a bar, what do I want from this space and who do I want to be there? And that was the other thing that really guided the creation of of my space is that I looked at what was in Northwest Portland Mm. and saw that there was a big gap for a space where everybody can go and feel comfortable. I am a cisgendered white male and, um, you know, we take up a lot of space in the world and (laughs) we can go to any bar and feel comfortable. You know, it doesn't matter what the bar is. I mean, outside of a country line dancing bar, um, I'm going to probably feel pretty comfortable. And that's really only because I don't dance. <laughs> but I am blessed to have a wonderful, deep and diverse group of friends. And in talking to my group of friends, I realized that they didn't all have the same experience I did. And so as I started to build this bar, I, I, I sat down with my friends and I said, what would it take for you to feel comfortable coming to my bar? And of course they were very flattering and said, well, Brian, we know it's your bar, so we're going to be comfortable. And I said, well, let's, let's, you know, take me out of the picture for a minute. You know, talking to my, my BIPOC friends, talking to my LGBTQ friends, talking to my female friends, really stopping and listening and saying, what is it that you would feel comfortable with for a bar? It was eye opening to me because again, as a, you know, straight cisgendered white male, there are a million little privileges that I have that I'm not aware of as I go through life. Something as simple as going to the bathroom, I don't, I don't think about, but to my trans friends, it is a huge issue. And so that's one of the reasons why our bathrooms are narwhals and unicorns. We don't have men's rooms. We don't have you know women's restrooms. We just have narwhals and unicorns. I like it. And I think that that's really what sets us apart from a lot of the other bars in the neighborhood is that while they are friendly to, you know, whether it's, it's, it's BIPOC individuals or to women or to the LGBTQ community, it's not a space that was specifically designed for them. Uh, It wasn't a space that was designed with them in mind. And I got to tell you that um, my bar is full of cisgendered white men and as well as LGBTQ people, as well as BIPOC individuals, as well as women. And that's a wonderful place to see everybody come together. You know, that's that's a great message. And that's something that I've discussed, you know, quite a bit on this on this podcast is one, 
from the business perspective, it's important to understand your consumer, right? And get that understanding from them. But two, we've also talked about those non-business things, those unconscious biases, right? That there's those things that we don't know, we don't know. And, you know, some of those conversations that need to be had are not conversations necessarily, but listening parties. Yeah. And, And that's the thing is that I tried very hard to ask the question and then shut my mouth. Um, and to really listen to what was being said and ask the follow-up questions of why and what about it and can you tell me more and how does this thing that you're saying make you feel more comfortable or make you feel less comfortable yeah. so that it's not just about you know having narwhals and unicorns for your, for your bathrooms, <laughs> but it's about the language that you use as a staff. It's about how you treat every customer that walks in the door so that regardless of where they're coming from, they feel like they're coming to a comfortable space for them. Definitely. Now let's, let's talk about the operations piece. Okay. Right. So we talked about kind of like you created your brand, right? Mm-hmm. I feel like we just talked about how you created your brand, but how did you create the bar? What, it was the kind of thing where, you know, you're, you're driving to work every day and you're talking about owning a bar, but when, if you've never done it there, you have no idea how much this thing costs. I mean, it could have cost a million dollars. It could have cost $50. I had no idea. Right. And so one of those late night internet searches, one click leads to another leads to another. And I found that I was looking for, you know, I was looking at a bar in downtown Portland that they wanted for $45,000. Now that's not the bar I ended up with, but at $45,000, that's real people money. Yeah. You know, a million dollars isn't really real people yeah. money. That, that, that's not something that... <laughs> that's what my college degree costs. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not something that I can, you know, move some money around, borrow a little bit here and there and Definitely. come up with. But $45,000, that's real people money. And so uh, that was the point that I started talking to my wife about it really seriously and said, you know, this is something you and I have talked about for when I retire after 30 years. Can we move this timeline up? And so um, she agreed and I started looking at spaces again that it became very clear that I didn't want that particular space. I started chasing down a space in Southeast Portland. It had been an Irish bar. I came up with a concept for the space, um, had my financing in place. Everything was great. And then I ran into my first real roadblock, which is that I have no experience and the owners of the building weren't really willing to rent to me because I had no experience. Mm. And it was a, it was a very humbling thing that, you know, at at 45 years old, I had a 20 year career under my belt. I have a house, I have a car, I have good credit. You know, those were things I was dealing with when I was starting my life out in my twenties and to be turning around and going, Oh yeah, this is what it was like to be told. No, this is what it's like to get those super high interest loans that because you don't have credit. Um, it was hard. And so I was, I was legitimately crushed when they came back and said, we like your proposal, but we're still not going to rent to you. And so put on my big boy pants and, uh, got up the next day and started looking at the ads again and stumbled across this bar. And at first I, I really didn't like it. My wife and I went and scoped it out one night after, um, after a Portland Thorns match and we both looked at each other and shook our heads and said, no way. <laughs> um, it was it was filthy. It was uh, completely unavi- in, uninviting to, to women. Uh, I mean, just completely. And the only reason that I went back the next day is I had already scheduled a, a showing with the owner and I wanted to respect him and his time. And so I went back and I saw it in daylight and took a look around and realized, no, the location for this bar is amazing. And you know what they say about real estate is location, location, location. Yep. And that's, that's kind of it for the bar industry too, that unless you have an, a known brand that people are going to seek you out for, it really is about location. And so I stumbled into an amazing location because I had all my financing in place. I was able to put down a cash offer on the spot for it. And, uh, that, yeah, the rest as they say is history. Nice. And you know, one of the things I want to highlight that you mentioned, you know, for those that listen at home, you can start being an entrepreneur at any age, yeah. right? Whether you're 12 or you're 112, it doesn't matter. Right. And one of the things you also have to know is it's not butterflies and rainbows, right. Uh, or, or, or unicorns and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> unicorns and narwhals. Exactly. And so, and so you have to be mindful of that, but you know, one of the things you also talked about, you know, the, the cost, how, how was this funded? Did you do a bootstrap? Did you go venture capital route? How did you go? Um, I basically tapped into my retirement. Mm, okay. Um, 
I had a little bit of money uh, from my grandparents. They passed away. But I think most importantly is not that I had the money is that I also inherited a financial advisor and I, I can't overestimate the importance of that financial ad- advisor in this. Um, again, not coming from a business background, I tend to operate a lot in the emotional quadrant, if you will, oh, yeah. mm-hmm. and not growing up with a lot of money. I'm, I'm emotionally tied to money when I have it, I I'm happy. And when I don't have it, I get very scared. And so, um, walking away from a good union job that mm. had all kinds of security associated with it, I needed someone who was not passionate about the money, who did not have an emotional attachment to it. And I was able to sit down with him and explain my business plan. I wrote up a full business plan for, for this all of my projected expenses, all of that, and sat down with him and and asked him about the risk because this was more money than I had ever really had to deal with other than, you know, buying a house. But it, it was that kind of thing where having someone who sat down with me, took away all of the passion, took away all of the, the, the emotion and just looked at the numbers. And he was able to say to me that, you know, this is well within your risk range. If this goes completely belly up and you lose all the money you put into this, you will still keep your house. Your kids will still get to go to college. You will, you know, you'll have to go back to work, of course, right. but you are not going to face financial ruin because of this. That was huge because again, I was so in the middle of everything that I needed that impartial voice to, yeah. to walk me through. And, and quite honestly, had he said, Brian, this is, this is too big of a risk. I would have walked away from it. Yeah. Yep. And you know, that's one of the things too, we've talked about. It's so important. Essentially the entrepreneur's role is, is to minimize risk, right? To mitigate mm-hmm. their risk in, in any way, shape or form. What was your kind of outline for your risk? Did you have like, Hey, I want to be at this point in my life or what, what, what was your risk factors? What's your risk corridor? Boy, um, for me, it was at some point in time in my life, I want to stop working. I want, I want to retire. My, my father-in-law worked very, very hard his entire life, 30 years, forklift driver, retired and immediately had to go back to work that, that, I mean, that was, that was the reality of his life. And that I don't want that to be my life. Like I said, I enjoy traveling. I enjoy spending time with my wife and enjoy spending time with my kids. And so for me, the risk really was, is this going to screw that up? Am I going to have to, you know, end up working the rest of my life this is, you know, as far as retirement goes, I got to tell you, don't buy a bar. I mean, that you, you, <laughs> this is not the luxury lifestyle. I, I have yet to sit at my bar and drink with my friends. You know, mm. it, this isn't it. You know, the realities of, of entrepreneurship and, and owning a bar is it is 80 to 100 hour work weeks. It yeah. is two in the morning, every morning, seven days a week, 360. Well, for me, 363 days a year. I try to take Thanksgiving and Christmas. I like it. Um, <laughs> but you know, so, so for me, you know, the risk really, the, the thresholds were, am I in so deep that this is going to ruin my life? Is this going Mm -hmm. to make the, the stress on my family too much? And so that was, that was it. And, and my wife and I sat and we talked about it where she was comfortable, where I was comfortable every time. I mean, COVID was, was brutal. Uh, there were two shutdowns for us during COVID. We made the decision during the second shutdown to fully remodel the bar. And so that was a a huge outlay of cash at a time when none was coming in. And I ended up having to dip into the savings some more, but that was something that I needed to to talk to my wife about. I needed to talk to my financial advisor about yeah. because I needed to make sure that again, if this whole thing happened, you know, COVID just never ended, where were we going to be? And we were still within, within the parameters. Definitely. So that was, that was wonderful to hear. Yeah. You know, one of the things you've, you've mentioned quite a bit now is, is your wife and, and how important she has been. Let's, let's talk about that a little bit. I really want to hear how important is having a partner like that supporting you? How important is that? 
It's, it's amazing. She is, I mean, she would laugh if I said she was a silent partner because she's, she's not silent. <laughs> uh, she does, she is not involved in the day-to-day operations of the bar. What she is, is my day-to-day sounding board, my confidant. Um, she has worked her entire career in, in industry and in business. Uh, she's an IT professional. And so she has insights into how corporate worlds work. Mm -hmm. And so that has been huge for me to talk to her about things because, I mean, I've never had to deal with things like hiring people and firing people and making sure that the electricity stays on. I mean, those are all things that Portland Public Schools took care of. (laughs) Um, You know, she's my biggest cheerleader. She really is. Uh, She also is the first person to smack me on the back of the head and tell me to stop thinking about things so much. Uh, she is really good about talking about decision paralysis, which is something that I, I fall into quite often. Unfortunately, we were standing in home Depot and I was fretting over the color of the, the laminate flooring to put down in the bar. (laughs) I mean, I'm, I'm serious. I'm standing there. It must've been 30 minutes. I mean, this is laminate flooring for a bar. And (laughs) she finally just said, you're going to make a decision. You're going to make a decision now. And you're going to move on because this is in the grand scheme of things. This is nothing. You have far larger things to deal with. And she was right. But again, having someone there who is invested in me and invested in the bar, we like to joke that I have a fiducial responsibility to my wife now. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Having a, having a cheerleader who cheers for you, but also calls you on your crap yeah. is, is yeah. I, I got to call the BS you do. And I, and, and I, I, this, this bar would not be successful without her. Even if she is not there day in and day out, she is there day in and day out. Nice. So, you know, you mentioned, you know, you came from, you know, 20 years of public service, right. Mm-hmm. In, in our school district and then going to entrepreneurship, what would you say kind of surprised you about the process of going from, you know, being uh, in, in, in Portland public school system and then to in, your own boss, to your point, having to pay for electricity and all this, what was, what surprised you? I mean, I think that there's, there's the good surprises and the bad surprises. And you know, the, the bad surprises are you sit there in the back. It's easy to sit there in the back of the room and second guess the person who's in charge and the person who's making all the decisions. And then when you realize that you are that person, and now it's a difficult decision and things that, you know, when you're sitting in the back of the room, because uh, you know, my employees come to me all the time and they have, they have ideas. They, they, I mean, they genuinely want the bar to be better. And then they get frustrated when I don't necessarily follow through with their ideas, but I have a full picture that they don't necessarily have. And so that's kind of the negative part of it, which is that, yeah, it's a lot harder to be the boss when you're the boss for the first time. Yeah. The positive side is that all those times that you sat there in the back of the room going, man, when I'm the king, when I'm the boss, when I'm the, you know, when I'm in charge, things are going to be different to actually be able to make those points and to actually be different about how you treat your staff, to be different about how you choose to run your business, the decisions that you make, that feels good to, to get to create that different work space, that different work environment. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, for me, that was, that's been the best part is to, to actually create the kind of space where I want to work. It's funny because a lot of entrepreneurs have come on this show and and talked about the loneliness of it. It's difficult for people to really relate. Have you ever felt that? Um, Constantly. I mean, it's, it's a challenge to, you know, there's, there's the, the emotional loneliness. I mean, uh, I get home at somewhere between depending on the night, three, four, sometimes five in the morning and my, my wife's asleep. My kids are asleep. I sleep until 10 or 11 or 12 and they're, they're gone. And so there's that level of loneliness. And then my friends are wonderful and they try to come to the bar, but you know, the, the bar is too busy. I'm working. It's, it's like visiting your friend at work. You know, there isn't a whole lot of time. But then there's also that loneliness of I don't have other friends in the bar industry, mm-hmm. really. I don't have other friends who are necessarily entrepreneurs. And so there aren't a lot of people who to talk to and to bounce ideas off of. And as as nice as it is to meet other bar owners, I mean, at the end of the day, 
there are some secrets you want to keep, you know, yeah. you don't necessarily want to talk about your books with another bar owner. You don't necessarily want to talk about your labor numbers with another bar mm-hmm. owner. And so while there are bar owners who um, I've become friendly with, who have been incredibly generous in sharing their time in, incredibly generous there there's a wonderful community of oh my god i just ran out of of printer paper at nine o'clock on a saturday night can you help me out Mm, there's definitely that but as far as the you know i'm sitting down you know right now staring down the the cook shortage that is happening across the country and we, we can all commiserate with each other, but it's also difficult to sit down and say, so what incentives are you offering? Because, I mean, that, that and it's almost a trade secret at that point right, in time. Right. And so, yeah, there's some loneliness for that. You know, the pandemic has, has been a difficult time for a lot of people. How do you, where do you kind of envision the pharmacy? Mm-hmm. How do you envision it emerging out of this? I, I like to say that we've made lemon meringue pie out of lemons when it comes to the pandemic. We uh, had... Our first COVID shutdown, when I bought the bar, the bar was legitimately known as the worst kitchen on the block. I had regulars tell me that my bar was the bar where they came to get loaded. They would go somewhere else to have food and then would come back to my bar to finish out the night. And during the first shutdown in the summer of 2020, the people wanted to support the bar however they could, which was incredibly kind and generous of them because everyone was hurting, everyone was suffering. And the way that they could do that was they could come to the bar and order food because we did to go food and to go beer. And I had worked very hard on changing the menu because again, like I said, at the start of this, I enjoy throwing a party and what is party center around food? Totally. At least for me, it centers yep. around food. And so for the first time people were trying our food beyond the chicken strips and realizing, wait a minute, no, the food here is different. The food here is good. And so when we came back out of that first shutdown, our food sales went went way up because people were able to to listen, you know, to have the food and to try it. And then when the second shutdown happened at the end of 2020 and into 2021, that was the time where we look or took a really hard look at the space and said, what can we do to make this space better? And my father, who, uh, again, if I would be remiss if I didn't point out my father, my father's a retired woodworker and he literally built the bar. He, he, he built the, the physical structure of the bar and he had had the idea to move the bar from its location to a more prominent location in the space. And that's what we did. We, we took the bar and I'd say we physically picked it up and moved it. My rugby team physically picked up and moved the bar. It's nice knowing big guys. Um, <laughs> and God willing, that's the last time the governor's going to say you have to be closed for three months and you can't make money. Yeah. Uh, because that's how long it took. It took three months to move everything, move the plumbing, move the electricity, move the water, everything. And now you walk down the street and you can see the bar. And had it not been for COVID, that would have been much further down the road for us. Yeah. And so... I see us emerging out of COVID in a much better, stronger place. Um, our, our numbers are significantly higher than they were pre COVID, but that's because we took that opportunity. Uh, going back to my financial advisor, he, he and I sat down once we were talking and he said, I kind of want to explain my philosophy to you. When you see the stock market rising, you may not see your, your you know portfolio growing very much, when the stock market's falling, you're going to see us buying a lot of things that, that, that we're going to look for the opportunities and right. take those opportunities because we see long-term growth. And that's what COVID has been for us. It's we've taken a horrible situation, looked at the opportunities. The first opportunity was to introduce people to our menu. The second opportunity was to change the physical space into something much more inviting. And so now I think that coming out, we're poised to be in a much, much better place. So is that kind of your differentiator, your, your food and your ambiance, right? You mentioned your, your bathrooms. I think that our differentiator is really that we are the bar for everybody nice. that there are on the street. There are, you know, there are corporate bars that are owned by, you know, places that have 50 outlets. There are, um, bars that are you know sports and sort of college themed bars there are bars that are designed for just kind of a 
a specific demographic, if you will. Mm -hmm. And our differentiator is that it's the kind of bar where you walk in and you feel like, wait a minute, I'm represented in this bar. Whether you're a BIPOC individual, a gay individual, uh, a woman, or yeah, even a cisgendered white guy, um, there, there's something for you in the, in our bar. And that's, that I think is what sets us apart. I like it. Now, if you were were to, you know, going through this process, Mm -hmm. let's exclude the pandemic. Okay. Okay. Would you change anything? I think that for me, I would be more confident and I'd be bolder. Um, that that's been a hard thing for me. Again, it goes back to never really having been in charge before. Mm-hmm. I would speak up a lot more for for my bar, for me, for for my people. It's it's been a hard lesson to learn mm-hmm. that there are not everybody is has your best interest in mind, especially mm-hmm. when it comes to business. Yeah. Uh, not everybody is as collaborative as you may be. And so when you don't speak up, they take that space, they take that opportunity. They don't necessarily share 50, 50. Mm. And so, uh, I think that looking back on it, there are several times where it, it would have been a lot better had I done the uncomfortable thing for me of, of standing up and saying, you know what, we, we need this, this, the bar needs this, my people need this, I need this. Yeah. And, um, and that's okay. I think, yeah. And I think that's the thing that I'm coming to terms with is that it's okay to tell people what you want and what you need. Definitely. Now, what, what advice would you give younger entrepreneurs that are kind of starting the business, maybe want to open a bar? What advice would you give them? I would say that be clear in your, in your passion, be clear in your dream, be clear in what it is that you want and do everything you can to make that happen and have a reason for it that people are willing to get behind your passion and people are willing to get behind your enthusiasm for a while, but people are willing to stick with you if they can understand your reason why it sounds silly, but we have kittens on the TV in my bar (laughs) and you know, we, we, we have kittens, we have chickens, we have the bears eating salmon on the falls in Alaska. It sounds silly, but that's a conscious choice that, you know, it's one thing if, if you just have it in your bar, but if you can explain to people, if you can explain to your staff that this is because, you know, not everybody wants to watch college baseball. Not yeah. everybody wants to watch the NFL. Not everybody wants to watch all the things that are on at every other bar. If we can consciously choose to put marble racing on, then all of a sudden we're creating conversations between people. All of a sudden we're making it so that you don't have to feel like you have to walk into this bar and care about sports. You can just be you and laugh and have a good time. And if you can get the staff behind you, the reasoning behind it, then yeah, having narwhals and unicorns in your bathrooms, Mm -hmm. then, you know, all of a sudden it's not just about having, Oh yeah, we, you know, we don't care what bathroom you use. No, it's a conscious choice so that you feel comfortable it, it's all those things, the art, the, you know, we, we choose the art on the wall very, very carefully so that again, you walk in and, you know, it, it draws your attention to it and, and you, you feel like you are there. I like it. So for the folks at home that they want to grab a drink, they want to wet the whistle. There right? you go. How, how can they, how can they find the pharmacy? Where are you located at? What about your social media channels? So we are located at 2100 Northwest Gleason street. Um, that is the corner of 21st and Gleason in Northwest Portland. Uh, you can find us online at the pharmacy pdx.com or that's also our social media. So Facebook and Instagram, we are there as well. Nice. Brian, owner of the pharmacy. Thank you for tuning in to the shades of entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit the shades of E.com.